There are some key markers of adulting, taking vitamins, having a favorite spatula, and landing that real job. It makes you sit down at the end of the day and ask, uh, is this it? But you've come this far. I mean, you've worked this hard. After all, what would you even want to do instead? My next guest was a 20-something with a degree in hand when she hit a wall at her successful secure job. In response, she did what many do, went back to school. While enrolled in the PhD program, she was a professor at a business school, and she hated the job. After years of pushing through, she broke down in a Starbucks. Now she's the best-selling author of Careergasm and is a career coach helping people figure out what they want so they can have the big O at work or something like that. Today, she's going to share the questions that lead to the right answers as we ask the question, what do you do when you don't know what you want to do? Recovering academic, playfully unserious, potty mouth go-getter, Sarah Vermont. Thanks for oh, being here. That's the coolest intro I've ever had, baby. Thanks for that. It's really cool to be here. <laughs> I have to ask, did you go back to Starbucks? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm a 40-year-old white woman, and I got to get a pumpkin spice latte now and then. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't go to that Starbucks for a while. I mean, the Starbucks story is I was working on some research at the time and I I had been sort of in denial about how much I hated my work for a while. And for whatever reason, on that day, something just broke. It honestly felt like an out-of-body experience and I just couldn't do that kind of work anymore. So I often tell people it was both a long time coming and uh, it happened very suddenly. But yes, I did make it back to Starbucks once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a girl's got to have her caffeine fix. <clears throat> it sounds like a dramatic outcome for some, but I think a lot of people do that. You know, like on the weekends, they will overspend, overdrink, trying to get back those feel-good feelings. And you kind of sit back and wonder, oh my gosh, how did we get here? But the real question is, where do you begin to figure out what you want when the answer for so long has been, uh, whatever pays the bills? Yeah, that's right. Um, isn't it interesting how binary thinking can really get in our way, like in so many ways? But I can tell you a lot of the people I help with career changes, um, they understandably get really hung up on the sort of belief that, well, I can either have a job that pays the bills or I can have a job that makes me happy. And the problem with sort of right. even unconsciously carrying that belief with you is that it sort of stops you from thinking creatively before you even get started. Um, so, you know, there might be some people listening who are like, oh, my God, I have totally had that belief and I didn't even know it until I just heard this chick just say it out loud. So there's nothing <laughs> wrong. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with people for believing that necessarily. It's a really natural thing to do. But when you can catch yourself in binary thinking, I think that's actually the opening that helps you just start to think a little bit more open mindedly. <laughs> about what um, a, a different way that you can think about work. But yeah, money is for sure a part of it. How do you know that you need a new career and not just need to spend your free time in a different way? Well, I guess, like, how happy are you during your work day, right? I, I really think it's important mm. to have both, you know, to have a life that feels fulfilling. And certainly for a lot of people, work is an important piece of that, especially if if you have a job that doesn't allow you to have a life, that's probably a sign that some changes are necessary. But also if you think about how often, you know, we how much time we spend at work, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, for some people, it's actually a lot more. And so if you're spending a lot of your life not enjoying most of the day, that's probably a good sign. I, I always you know, your, your relationship with your job should feel like a lot of other relationships in your life in that it should feel good most of the time. No relationship feels mm. good all of the time, including <clears throat> the one with your job. But if it feels good most of the time, you're probably on a great path. And if it doesn't feel good most of the time, then, you know, maybe it's time to start thinking about a change. In your book, you talk a lot about the questions being the key to unlocking the right answers, what are some of the wrong questions that people ask when it comes to their careers? 
What does my resume say I'm most qualified for? And here's, it's a valid question, but here's why it trips people up sometimes. If you take a look at your resume and you ask someone, okay, what are my quote unquote transferable skills? What are the things I'm most qualified for? It's a real easy question to answer because it's going to point you right back in the direction of work that you're already doing, right? On this sort of same area of work that you're doing. Why that's a problem for most of the folks I work with is they're unhappy with the current career path they're on. So if you start with the question, what does my experience say I'm most prepared for? It doesn't give you a lot of options. How do you zoom out when you are working more than 40 hours a week, when you do feel misery in your eight hour day, when you've been brainwashed by society to think, well, of course you don't like your job. It's called work for a reason. How do you begin to even take that time to go step back and have these thoughts? Yeah, you're, this, this thing you're sort of touching on around zooming out, I'm really glad you're touching on it because I think that's actually the key to getting unstuck. Sometimes the reason people can't figure out what they want, you know, they're, they have busy lives and they don't have a ton of time for this soul searching and they just want the answer already. All of that, totally valid. Um, but sometimes when you're trying so hard and you're just looking for that bullseye quick answer, um, it's not easy to arrive at the answer. And so zooming out, the way I zoom out with people and what I would suggest for your listeners is instead of asking yourself what your dream job is, start asking yourself, what kind of career ingredients do I want? What sort of tasks and values and interests and um, what sort of little pieces do I want my career to be composed of? And also, which pieces do I not want to invite in the next phase of my career? And it's interesting when you start to do that, you just sort of look, you know, at the, the facets of what you want in your career. It becomes a little bit easier because you relax a little bit because you're not looking for a straight shot to the perfect answer right away. You're just sort of exploring your desires and what you want. And doing that for a little bit actually takes the pressure off. So that's a great place to start. Is that what you talked about in your book about being effortful and yeah. relaxing from that <laughs> idea? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So one of the things I like to talk about is sometimes when you're striving, 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 trying so hard, you miss the the nuances of the things that actually matter to you. So here, here's an interesting analogy. It's weird, but stick with me, okay? Okay. <laughs> have you ever tried really hard to have an orgasm? And it's just not <laughs> Yeah, I promise I'm going somewhere. Okay, so that feeling of trying to get at the finish line <laughs> is not unlike, it's not unlike the um, sort of like strained effort that, you know, people put into trying to get to the finish line of what do I want for my career. I've certainly been in that position. And of course, we know that the way to actually get there is to relax into it a little bit. But I like I got to say, there's nothing more annoying than someone telling you to relax. Right. So. Oh, totally. <laughs> right. Right. So, you know, I think if we acknowledge that we have to relax into exploring our interests and our desires a little bit, as long as we ha sort of have a plan for how to relax into it, that's helpful. So that's what I mean about the, you know, sort of maybe pausing your job search for a minute, maybe pausing on needing to know your exact dream job title, maybe just for a couple of weeks or a month or so to sort of muck around and play with career ingredients. That's one of the ways that someone can relax into some exploration. And ultimately it will take them to the finish line, but it takes a minute to get there. Oh, I love that. I <laughs> I love that you or earlier you were talking about, oh, I'm not going to invite that aspect into the next job. Like they're annoying little coworkers, you know. <laughs> oh, you can stay. Thank you very much. <laughs> what what are some examples of career ingredients? Feel free to give examples from clients that you've worked with because sometimes when there's a story, of course, people can paint themselves into that picture a little bit more clearly because I think I know what you mean by career ingredients, but I think I could use 
some examples. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad you're asking because you're absolutely right. So I'll give you a couple examples that are really common for people, but I will say everybody's different, right? So what might be a yes for some people will be a no for some people. Um, something that's been coming a lot, up a lot for people um, is sort of like control and micromanagement. A lot of people are like hard pass on that. I've dealt with too much of that. I And you know, it's also helpful if you not only figure out what the thing is, the ingredient that you do or don't want, but also why. So for example, I've noticed there's, two, I mean, I'm really boiling it down here, but there's two main reasons why people hate micromanagement. One is that people just find it annoying and it interrupts their flow, right, of their work. The other is that they don't like the feeling of not being trusted. So the reason it's helpful to know why maybe you don't want or you do want this particular ingredient is it sort of helps you get a more nuanced feeling about the desire underneath this sort of list you're building of the stuff that you would or wouldn't like to have in your next phase of your career so that you can better identify that stuff when you're getting closer to actually making your move. This sounds so much like a relationship. <laughs> I mean, here's so the thing. It is. It's a relationship with your work, right? It's not with another person, but like we do have relationships with our careers. We have relationships with people in our organization. So you're absolutely right to notice that parallel. <laughs> I love that. Okay. What are some other career ingredients? Micromanaging is a great example of something you don't want. What are some examples people have given you about what they do want? A lot of the people I work with are really sick of like corporate optics, like rules for the sake of rules. Um, that drives a lot of people crazy. Um, and so they're looking for a little more freedom, a little more flexibility, an opportunity to be a little more creative with their work. Some people are looking, this isn't everyone, but some people are really caring about impact. Like they want to know that the thing they do every day, even if they're not the, the person who's, you know, speaking to someone or you know, is having that final flourish in their work, they want to know that they're a part of a place that has a positive impact on individuals. And certainly, a lot of people are rightly looking to be fairly compensated. They know they have bills to pay. They want to keep growing in terms of like professional growth, but they they would like to be making more money. Usually when I make lists with people, folks will end up with what I call hell yes and hell no lists of these ingredients with probably, gosh, I don't know, maybe 20 things on each list. And they'll start to notice that some things sort of rise to the top. Like you might have 20 things on your list, but you'll notice, ooh, like four or five of them really matter to you. So it's important to notice that, you know, if, if a person does do this exercise, that, you know, you'll notice which ones are weighted a little more strongly as well. How do you help people discern what they actually want versus what they've been told they want their whole life? It's people who have maybe followed a traditional career path because of familial tradition. Their dad's a doctor, their granddaddy's a doctor. And so it's so hard for them to even hear that inner voice of what they want. Or maybe because, you know, they can't see past their financial situation. They have a very prestigious job, but they're house poor. And so thinking of what else they would want, making this list you're talking about, feels threatening to their security by just even having the thought. Yeah. So you're kind of talking about two things here, which is good because nothing is in isolation, right? Some of the fears they're having come <laughs> up might be around, you know, the financial side of security, right? But I think the other thing that you're getting to, which is actually the heart of your question, let me know if I'm wrong, um, is like, how do I figure out what I want versus what I have been conditioned to think I should want what the people in my life have wanted for me and have, you know, maybe not even said so explicitly, but I was sort of conditioned from either family or the world or maybe an important mentor of my, a mentor of mine really had an impact. Um, you know, that's tricky. One thing that's, that's helpful that someone may want to consider is to ask what the primary emotion they're feeling is when they think about a particular, let's say, career path, if that's something they're exploring. So on the one hand, um, if you're noticing that a lot of your decision making has tended to come from a place of anxiety, that's 
not always, but often a sign that you're sort of pushing against some conditioning, right, that you've had in your life. Um, and that's healthy to do, to notice that you've been influenced and to notice that maybe it doesn't feel so good to have absorbed all that conditioning. On the other hand, when you brush up against, even if it's just for a moment, and at the beginning, it usually only happens in just moments. When you have a moment where you brush up against something that feels right and aligned, you will probably have more of a calm feeling. It won't have that sort of wound up hamster wheel of anxiety feeling. Now, listen, you might have the hamster wheel of anxiety feeling immediately after that sense of calm when you start thinking about the logistics and, oh my God, what are people going to say? But I do think the sort of gut alignment nudges we get uh, from, you know, our, our wise internal selves, they tend to come from like a a pretty calm, grounded place. And it's usually when we're feeling anxiety, it's often because it's wound up in some sort of external conditioning, which is tricky. It is tricky. <clears throat> Isn't it funny how much of successful decision making has to do with being aware of what signals your body is giving you? It's, it's funny. It, it's wild. And when people start realizing that we are mammals and we also come programmed with biological feedback, there's a real sort of light bulb that goes on. And they're like, oh my God, that's why I feel ill every Sunday night when I'm thinking about going to work next week. Or, oh my God, that's why the hairs stand back up, uh, stand up on the back of my neck when I have to deal with a certain person. You know, in the world we live in, whether it's your personal life, your work life, we often forget that we we don't just live from the neck up. We're conditioned to do so, right? We live in a very sort of logic obsessed society. And so most of us for a long time have ignored these sort of physiological sensations that can actually help us navigate life. But man, when we realize that that's almost like an internal compass and when you learn to use it, it can really help you make good decisions. Even if they're not decisions, that other people or society at large would necessarily sanction and approve of. So you're saying don't poll our friends and family and ask them what we should do next? <laughs> well, I mean, listen, if you have someone in your life who you genuinely trust, who you know is a real advocate for you, and if you're feeling lost, there's no harm in asking that person or two if they have any thoughts or inklings about what kind of work might be best for you. But I will say for most people, they get a lot of unsolicited advice from loving people. You know, these are probably your family, your friends, people who genuinely care about you and are trying to help. But unsolicited advice from people isn't typically helpful because the truth is most people don't need another opinion about what they should do. Most people need the confidence and the support to find a way to listen to their own internal voice. And that's really hard to do when there are other voices outside of you that are, let's say, maybe being a little bit overly helpful about what they think <laughs> you should do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, air quotes helpful. <clears throat> yeah, air quotes helpful. And like the truth is like, they probably are genuinely coming from a place of wanting to either help you or let's say if it's a parent, especially protect you. You know, folks who are a generation older than you, it doesn't matter what age you are, they're going to be concerned about the way you're going because maybe it's a little bit different than what people in their generation did, right? So they might feel a little more spiky mm -hmm. and a little more triggery around career stuff. This is something a lot of people experience <laughs> around parents. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes when you start to realize what's best for you, all of a sudden other people start projecting all of their own shit onto you and they're not even conscious about doing it, but people will project their own fears onto you, especially around this career stuff because career decisions are big decisions. And a lot of people have fears and regrets about their own careers. So when they start swinging that stuff around, it's really important to be discerning and not necessarily just absorb it as advice that you should listen to. Yeah, because it can be like crabs in the bucket, right? Like one crab is trying to get out 
and then it, yes. it brings the other crab down. I back in my day, I had to work. 500 hours barefoot uphill with the snow or whatever, <laughs> yeah. whatever ridiculous thing yeah. it was. And we kind of pass that on, not meaning to, but we do. Okay, so let's say yeah. uh, a person has their list and their ingredients, as you call that. I love the ingredients, right? Because it just, yeah. it uh, disconnects it from the job title because so often... Yeah. We look for the job title and then we try to match ourselves to it. But so many jobs now didn't exist 20 years ago, right? When I was in high school, I would take those career assessment tests and I was either supposed to be a mental health counselor or a travel agent. (laughs) And, you know, (laughs) podcaster was not a real thing. So... Yeah. It's. I love the career in- ingredient part of it. So let's pretend someone's got their ingredients. And now what? Now what do they do? They try to find a job that matches it. What's the next step? Uh, that is a step, but it's, you're getting a little bit ahead of the game. The next step is actually to sort of creatively about how you could combine some of those ingredients mm-hmm. together because ex- because of exactly what you said. A lot of the things that you could do for your career aren't necessarily things that you're going to easily find in a job post. For some folks, maybe it's making something yourself, like a podcast, or in my case, creating a business. So it's important to think creatively about how you might want to combine some of those ingredients together. And you know, it might be, you might come up with, let's say, five to 10 ideas, and some of them might be a little more creative than others. Some of them might be quite traditional. You'll realize there are some things out there in the sort of more traditional corporate nine to five world that do include a lot of these ingredients. So doing a bit of creative brainstorming is important. And that's sort of where the magic happens because then you're able to think a little bit more freely about, I don't know, the the possibilities. And the goal is to put a bunch of stuff on the table, not get too attached to any of it. And then here's an important piece to talk to people who are doing the work that you're curious about. It's really, amazing how much you can learn in a short conversation with someone about their experience navigating a certain field um, that'll take you way beyond what you can learn in internet research. Um, So that's something I have all of the folks that I work with do just to help them sort out, you know, what's going to feel good, what's not, are there any red flags here that I should look out for? Are my assumptions about this thing that I think I might want to do actually true or am I off the mark a little bit? Is that what you talk about in your book about dabbling? You know, you you encourage people to dabble in things that they're curious about. Is talking with people part of that or does it go deeper to volunteering in certain areas or working part time in, in, a, in a job before you decide to, you know, jump ship? Yeah, that certainly is a part of it, talking to people who are doing the work. But some people, some people feel a little bit safer making the jump if they have, let's say, taken a course or two in that area, or like you say, volunteered in an area or done some job shadowing with a person, maybe in your same organization, but like another department that you're interested in. I'd like to think of it as like a toe dip before you dive into something new. Some people are super comfortable um, jumping into something new without the toe dip, but for folks who are you know, feeling a little cautious, feeling like they want to feel fully informed about what it feels like to be in a certain area of work, there are all sorts of ways you can dabble with the volunteering, the courses, the job shadowing, you know, taking on some freelance work, some consulting work. It does help you get a sense of what that work might feel like if you want to jump into it full time. Is there any third step, career ingredients, dabbling conversations, market research, if you will. I love that. Is there a third step before you, you know, make the cake, if you will, since we're talking about ingredients and I like food? Oh, I love that. Yeah. 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 The third step is looking at all of you've learned from your dabbling and from the conversations, looking at all of that stuff with discernment and then checking it against your hell yes and hell no lists to see okay, is what I've learned about this area, does it have a lot of the stuff on my hell yes list? And does it exclude a bunch of the shit on the no, the hell no list? So those lists is almost like a, a good check and balance for yourself to see if what you're learning is actually taking you in the right direction. And so at that point, you will be able to clearly take some things off the table that maybe you were considering. And you'll have really probably just a small handful of things that still feel really good 
that you think you want to pursue, then you're ready to either build what you want to build or start your job search. Um, Starting a job search before that isn't something I recommend because a lot of your listeners have probably had the experience of, you know, scrolling through the postings and getting more and more sort of disheartened and depressed as they're doing it because it's really hard to do a good job search if you don't know what you're looking for. But when you are clear about what you want, all of a sudden it's really easy um, to have a clear yes and no for every single posting that you're seeing. Oh, that's, I think that's true. I think that there's something about getting clarity first before you take action and that uh, makes the whole action part a little bit more sustainable because you're less likely to burn out. And I do want to talk about the implementation aspect of it more. But before we go there, I want to talk about outgrowing your career because some people, maybe they got it right in the beginning, like they loved whatever their job was. They loved being in a lawyer. I know I read that you, you most of your clients are lawyers. Uh, how, what are some signs that you've outgrown your career? When it comes to even thinking about a career change, it comes with a lot of um, shame and self-judgment. And a lot of people carry the thought or the belief, uh, I chose the wrong path. I made a mistake early in my career yep. and I picked the wrong thing. And I think a more empowered reframe probably is you probably chose what was good for you, for the person you were at the time, but you've grown and changed and evolved since then. So it's only natural that you are going to grow into and out of things along your career path. And so when you're looking at things through that lens, it just feels a little gentler, a little softer. You can sort of let yourself off the hook a little bit about having outgrown something. And you can actually, it doesn't mean it's not a challenge, but you can see it as something positive that has happened to you, that you are ready to grow into something else. And a good way to tell if you have outgrown something is to, you know, a lot of people will say they just feel like things feel like a little bit too tight, a little bit constrained, almost like, actually, almost like when you're a kid and you like, you grow out of the winter coat, you're ready to put it on next year. And you're like, oh my God, this does not fit anymore. It was perfect once upon a time. But anytime you're sort of feeling constrained, tightness, you feel like you want to expand a little bit more in your work. That's a really good sign that uh, you've probably been doing some growing, perhaps without knowing it, and you're ready for something new. And listen, it might it might not be an entirely new career. It might just be leveling up on your current path, but it probably means there's a change somewhere that's needed. I love that. How does our perception of success influence our career path? You know, going back to the lawyers that you work with, I suspect, and I want to hear your take on this, that the more work that it took to get to the career, and the more prestige that is perceived outwardly for said career, that it would be more difficult for people to unstick their identity from the career and and uh, and that whole success part of it. Because, oh, if I'm not this, what am I? And if I am not this, I'm not successful. And uh, yeah, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, preach exactly. You've said all of that exactly <laughs> right. I don't even know if I can add any more because you've said it perfectly. This is also something I experienced, actually, as someone who left academia. I had all sorts of, uh, I guess, ideas about who I was wrapped up in my work. And I think sometimes when you are someone who, let's be real, overly identifies with your work, it becomes harder to think about even considering something else. So you're right, this happens for people who work in prestigious professions. It also, you know, happens for folks who work in any profession that they are strongly identified with. Um, It happens a lot for people who are entrepreneurs, actually, who've built a business, they've built their identity around a business, but then let's say the business isn't feeling so great anymore, and maybe they'd like to build something new, or maybe try going back to a traditional nine to five. I have to tell you, I am working with more entrepreneurs than I ever have before in my 10 years as a career change coach. People who've built something and it's not feeling as good as it used to, and they're now wanting to look at, 
you know, decoupling with that identity that they've built for themselves. So, you know, it's interesting. I often tell people that my work is sort of like the intersection of personal and professional development because there's so much mental and emotional untangling we have to do as humans around identity and fear um, along the way. Otherwise, we're not going to be open and receptive to making the changes that will be good for us. So there's just a little bit of gentle wiggling around that stuff that a person has to do. And the first phase to, to gentle wiggling is noticing. So if anyone's listening and they're like, well, I don't know how, how to, to wiggle out of this, I would say just for the next couple of weeks, for the next month, just notice how often you identify with your career. Like, what are the specific thoughts? Like, what's the sentence running through your mind when you're having some sort of, you know, uh, troubling, anxiety-inducing thought about potentially making a change? Because those are really good clues. And it's interesting. Noticing doesn't necessarily change that sort of mental and emotional dynamic you're going through. But it does, just in the noticing, I find, start to soften a little bit. Um, so that on its own can be helpful. I can totally see why you have to give yourself space to do all this. Because this is, as you said, the personal, the professional, mixing all together. This is deep emotional work. I mean, yeah. this yeah. really requires some some dedication to to following through on, on all of this. You can't just sit down... <laughs> and fill out a survey like you did your senior year of high school and yeah. you know it spits out an answer for you talk to me about using jealousy as a tool oh yeah so there's a there's a chapter in one of my books and a little worksheet that i give to clients that actually helps people i guess scratch the surface of their jealousy to see what's underneath the jealousy so what i do is i have folks sort of go through an exercise where they identify let's say three people they're jealous of and three people they admire. And they get really, really specific about, okay, I might not be jealous of everything about this person, but what are the uh, what are the things that are getting under my skin and just giving me that, you know, sort of ugly jealousy feeling? Well, it's interesting. When you do that with a few people and then you zoom out and you pool all of that stuff together, you will probably see a couple of themes emerge. For example, uh, you might start to notice that, oh wow, a lot of the people I'm jealous of um, have really creative careers. Or, oh wow, a lot of the people that I'm really jealous of, all six of them are actually entrepreneurs. Or, oh wow, the, the people that I'm jealous of um, have, have made some moves in their career that required a lot of bravery. Okay, so maybe that means I need to get out of my comfort zone a little bit. So I always think jealousy is not ever really about the other person, it's always about us. And if we look at it that way, it can actually be, you know, it's it's not a positive feeling, but it can be an empowered tool just to help you develop a little bit of self-awareness about what matters to you. I love that. Again, with the relationship analogies, mm -hmm. you know, the jealousy yeah. <laughs> and, and the giving it time. Those are so great. As we close, I want to talk about the active part of it, the action and the fear that comes with that. I loved the, how you quoted Jim Carrey in your book that fear disguised as practicality. And you also talk about how people, it's not that they don't know what they want, it's that they don't want to admit that they know what they want. And it's the not not knowing, it's the fear associated with the desire. How do we get past that block because it's a big one. Oh, it's a biggie. And also, you know, just to sort of like add a little something to what you're saying there, it's not necessarily always that people don't want to admit what they want, right? Because I, I know there's a lot of people out there who were like, listen, ladies, if I knew what I wanted, like I have tried and been trying <laughs> to figure it out for years. And if I knew it, I would be F and going after it. It's more like, it's more like because of the fear Sometimes we don't even have access to the part of us that knows what we want. Do you see like mm -hmm. the subtle the subtle difference mm -hmm. there? And yeah. so this this all of this stuff that we've been talking about about ingredients and zooming out and sort of the sort of like gut wisdom, exploring all of that stuff helps you tap into the part of yourself that knows that you might not just be connected with on a conscious level yet. So that's why this sort of internal work is such a key piece of it. 
Um, because if you try to bypass fear, um, as you get ready to make your move, you're going to have a brick wall come up that you haven't addressed before. Um, or you're not even going to consider some of the things that might actually be really good and nourishing for you because the minute fear comes up, you see it as an immediate no. And the truth is, fear, um, you know, fear can be a yes or a no. It's not, it's not as simple as, well, I feel fear, so I probably shouldn't do it. I always think it's really good to look at what your fear is paired with what other emotions your fear is paired with. So for example, is your is your fear paired with uh, avoidance, aversion? You know, the feeling you'd have if if you were forced to kiss someone you don't like, right? Is it is it like, <laughs> ugh, I want to I want to lean out of this. Um or is your fear paired with anticipation? Is this something that yes, you're scared of, but there's something that's drawing you a little bit clean. And that, that nuance, that sort of layering of emotion, if you can become a little bit more aware of that, that will probably help you make some better decisions. Wow, that's so good. I think everyone can relate to that, yeah. that leaning back the yuck. type of fear and the just the standing on the edge of a cliff type of fear, about to jump, about to act kind of fear. Knowing the difference is so interesting. Uh, thank you again for this amazing talk. Thank you for your incredible book. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, tell people where they can find it and how they can keep in touch with you. Okay. I am everywhere on all the socials at Careergasm. You can find me at careergasm.com. And I've given a link to you here, Meredith, for my free three-day course that people can take where they can do those lists of ingredients and get a little support to do that. It's totally free. Just go to careergasm.com for that. And actually... Your listeners might be interested to hear, I actually have a brand new podcast that is, I'm literally just editing it now. So by the time you release this, uh, you'll see my first few episodes there. It's also called Careergasm. So literally just look for Careergasm anywhere and there's lots of ways to find me. Oh, how exciting. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast land, <laughs> the podcast Thanks. universe. Thank oh, you. that's fantastic. I this is I when you talk about dabbling, I think podcasts are such a great way to dabble because you may not be able to get FaceTime with someone who's doing your dream whatever, but you can probably get ear time with them. They probably have a podcast yeah. or have been interviewed on a podcast. And so I'm excited for you and I'm so oh, thankful thanks. that you took this time in your very busy schedule to talk to us and help us figure out what to do when we don't know what to do. This has been great. Oh, my pleasure. And I just want to say the reason it was a hell yes to talk to you, I looked you up and I really, really love that you are all about nuance and you're all about looking at questions from all of the angles. So I just want to say kudos to you and your work too. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. <laughs>